Thank you very much, Suzanne, and um, it was really, really a pleasure. And by the way, that was not just advertising, that was a gift, because Biofabricate is the best conference when it comes to the future of design. So thank you for the gift to Alta Gamma. My name is Paola Antonelli, and I have, uh, I'm part of the steering committee, and I have helped Alta Gamma put together this conference. I'm very proud of that. And right now, I would like to bring you into the next panel that is going to be about biofabrication. Uh, it's true that it's 10 years. It's 10 years and more. It's 10 years for me since this exhibition, Design and the Elastic Mind, that is an exhibition that we organized at the Museum of Modern Art that was about design and science. And during that exhibition, I encountered the first ideas about biodesign or ideas about the future of design with biomaterials. And at that time, it was still quite naive and beautiful. So you can see here behind me a wedding ring made with bone cells by your loved ones. So these great students from the Royal College of Art would just grow the cells of your husband or wife and you would have a wedding ring made of these bone cells. Or up there is the design for a possible steak of the future. If you can grow meat in vitro, it can take any any shape, what shape should it have? And these two, at that time, students, now it's Dr. Daisy Ginsburg, but at that time, they were thinking that the best way to go would be to take the most beautiful cow in the British countryside, stuck the cow into an MRI machine without hurting the cow, taking the best scan and modeling the steak after that scan. And a lot has gone also since this object that was also in Design and the Elastic Mind, there was a little, it was about this small, a little coat made of mouse stem cells put in an incubator and grown in the exhibition so that people could see what we mean by growing design. And this was the work of Oron Katz and Jonat Zur from the University of Western Australia in Perth that is one of the most pioneering institutions in the field of biodesign and biofabrication. In these 10 years, since 2008 until now, and for Suzanne, who's such a pioneer, even longer, so much has happened. The first labs to enable citizens and, and children and adults to understand what it means to biofabricate and be citizen scientists. The first biodesign challenges in which students were invited to actually work with designers. Actually, the real pioneer is MIT with the iGEM challenge. Students and designers working together with biologists and synthetic biologists. Exhibitions like Grow Your Own, that was at the Dublin Center, Dublin Science Center, in which actually Cecil Tolas, that you'll hear from in the afternoon, together with Christina Agapakis, showed that we can grow cheese out of our own armpit cells. So things that are yicky but fantastic at the same time. Not to mention biofabricate. Uh, Suzanne started Biofabricate, I think, five or six years ago. And it was wonderful because at that time, it was all speculation. It was Natse. It was Maurizio was not even born yet, or maybe he was already there, I don't know, but Kurt participated in the second edition. So everybody was starting up and having ideas. Now, five or six years later, they are companies that are already at the second round of investment and that, as you have seen, are already collaborating with industries. MoMA also did a few things in those years. You know, we started with uh, Design and the Elastic Mind, then Biodesign, that is the work of Michael Myers, who, uh, William Myers, I'm sorry, who used to be working in the retail department at MoMA and decided to leave MoMA to focus on biodesign and publish books about them. We had several symposia about synthetic biology and design, and we also hosted the Biodesign Challenge for the past four years. So we've all become really involved as designers, as critics, as entrepreneurs, as curators. We really want to uh, have a part in the making of this future world. And you see here some of the efforts by designers that also show you different ways of biofabrication. 
You can have bees make vases on a scaffold, or you can have thousands of silkworms build a pavilion by studying their behavior and creating the right conditions for them to do the kind of architecture, to grow the kind of architecture that you want. You can also work on biofabrication by simply putting together new composites. You know, when we think of composites, we tend to think of fiberglass, so resins and glass or resins and other fibers, but it can also be the leftovers of corn stalks put together with mushroom mycelium and cooked and baked and uh, leavened into bricks that then can form whole architectures. This is MoMA PS1 a few years ago. And MoMA has also acquired the first synthetically designed virus, which is a very simple virus, but nonetheless, it's the production, the biofactor method that puts together 3D printing, as uh, Andrea and Lisa was showing, were showing with instead a computerized methodology. And this is really also what my friend and partner in crime, uh, Neri Oxman always talks about a new way of design that puts together computational design, additive manufacturing, materials engineering, and synthetic biology into this new form of design and of making that is going to possibly help us in the future also solve some of the big issues that we have created for ourselves and for the world. And this is an example by Neri. Neri Oxman works at the MIT Media Lab. And you see here, it's about 3D printing with resin, but also mixing in the resin some biological materials that enable also, this is of course a very fictional project, but it's the idea that we'll be, we'll be able to outsource our organs for optimal travel in space. This is just a way of thinking of possibilities. It's very speculative. Thankfully, the same artists and designers also talk about real practical applications. For instance, here is the work that Neri will actually present at the next Triennale di Milano, which I have the luck to be working on March 1st. She has found a way to take melanin, which is a naturally occurring uh, pigment and enzyme and hormone, and transfer it to architectural scale and make it reactive. And the idea is to create a new whaling wall that is going to base not any more on the projection of biblical ideas, but rather on skin color. So, a real representation of the ills of today and what we should really worry about. And Broken Nature, the next triennale, will deal with a lot of biofacturing and uh, biodesign. So, it's going to open on March 1st and uh, it's going to have the work of some of the speakers of today, luckily. So, I hope that you will all come and see it. It's going to be entitled Broken Nature and it's going to really uh, take at Literum, the kind of ideas that are presented by the speakers today and also by Neri. I use a lot this diagram, which I find very important, that shows that art, science, engineering, and design do not anymore have to be separate fields, but in order to build the future, they have to be really collaborating and feeding into each other. It's a Krebs cycle of metabolism, and it's not anymore just a Venn diagram. And and the people that you will see here today are not uh, only ex expert in one particular practice. They are improbable collaborations at some, in some cases and very probable ones in others. But we're all open to other disciplines and we all believe that in order to build the world, one has to really uh, get out of one's comfort zone and collaborate with others. And now I would like to call to the stage the people, the wonderful experts that will uh, actually take us through a ride in, the, in biofactoring. They will all present, well, except for Suzanne, who's already given her keynote, they will all present for seven minutes, and then we will come together in conversation. So I would like to call to the stage, you know, starting in alphabetical order, Natsei Chiesa, that actually Suzanne has already uh, mentioned, who is um, a great... Please, Nasse, yeah, uh, who's a great pioneer and uh, the director and founder of Faber Futures. You can find out more detailed bios for them in the program, so I won't waste time. I'll just tell you they're all fabulous. The second is Suzanne Lee in alphabetical order. So please, Suzanne, you can sit there and we'll be able to. Great. 
Um, then I would like to call Kurt van Menswort, uh, who is a wonderful artist and philosopher and the founder of Next Nature Networks and Blog. He's been looking at the speculative side and the possible futures. And then last but not least, Maurizio Montalti, uh, who's from Mogu and Officina Corpuscoli, who's uh, another transplanted Italian like me, whose specialty is mushroom mycelium, but his way of thinking is really broad-reaching. So maybe I'll, the first to speak will be Natsi, if you want to make your presentation, please. <laughs> yes, and this is yours. Thank you so much um, to everybody and uh, Alta Gamma for inviting me to be here. Uh, I have to say I've never been in a position to have Suzanne Lee speak before me and followed by Paola. So I feel like my presentation has been set up so beautiful, so beautifully, so thank you very much for that. <laughs> So the confluence of computational science and biology is creating an unprecedented revolution in, where biology, in which biology becomes technology. The scientific field of synthetic biology now enables us to engineer novel behaviors into living systems. In this sense, biology has become a design space. Today, I would like to talk to you about some of the cognitive and cultural leaps that have begun to take hold at exactly the same time that we are seeking to reevaluate and redefine our relationship with nature for the next 100 years um, and to follow. And this is really um, preceded by uh, 150 years of uh, extractivist uh, economies. Uh, and we're really wanting to see how the fourth industrial revolution will determine a continued success for ours and other species. And the state of mind that we enter this revolution really matters. In Homo Deus, um, Yuval Noah Harari pronounces that because of this confluence between the computational science and biology, uh, organisms are now living algorithms and therefore the living can be reduced to programmable interfaces through which data flows. Now synthetic biology is built on this idea. Um, integrating disciplines like systems biology, um, bioinformatics, chemical engineering, to build programmable living systems. As architects of the platforms and the tools that make biology, um, um, as architects of the platforms of the tools that make biology easier to engineer, synthetic biology startups are becoming the new tech stars of this era. Um, from value-added chemicals to pharmaceuticals and materials, biology as technology is opening up a potential application route um, that will transform entire industries. But what happens when you expand this interdisciplinary melting pot to include practitioners from the humanities? Um, once biology is easier to engineer, how are we going to make um, our material environment and what purpose will this serve? And if indeed algorithms um, are organisms and vice versa, what data sets are going to inform their existence? These are some of the questions that we are asking um, and exploring at Faber Futures, since biotechnology holds, in our view, many of the answers to some of our biggest challenges. We explore how we might leverage um, biology and biotechnology to enable sustainable futures. As a creative R&D lab, we focus on how a design-driven biotechnology opens up new possibilities for synthetic biology. So we're working in partnership with synthetic biology startups, with brands and emerging researchers to build an understanding of this emerging field and identifying where design and biology can drive innovation together. So at Faber Futures, we're working um, through an evolving framework where we explore ecology. We are asking how human-centered design is going to evolve when we start to design for a multi-species agenda. Cultures is focusing on the kinds of mindset changes that need to happen across disciplines and industry to enable this transition. Materiality is our R&D space where we really uh, explore new material paradigms that are emanating from biological systems design. And finally, frontiers. This is the place where we map the future possibilities, asking really uh, what are the new biological futures and how are we going to build them. 
And so why there's, um, while there's overlap uh, with some of the work that we've uh, been doing this year between all of these frameworks, um, I'd like to give you a brief snapshot of uh, what our project space looks like in this context. So you'll be familiar um, with uh, Project Silicolor. It's been referenced a couple of times um, this, this morning. And this is really where Faber Futures started. It's an internal R&D project where we're developing new craft processes for dyeing uh, textiles using bacteria. We're currently developing a new body of work uh, for the Cooper Hewitt Triennale, which opens next year. Now, we've been working with Silicolor for about eight years. Uh, it's a soil-dwelling uh, soil um, microbe uh, or bacteria that produces pigment, um, and we've been working with it to dye textiles. And we've been developing different protocols that enable us to start to arrive at a range of different aesthetic outcomes. It turns out that uh, beyond the aesthetics, when you grow Streptomyces seedy color directly onto textiles, you can reduce the water consumption for dye processing by up to 500 times, and at the same time, eliminating the need for toxic chemicals that are ordinarily used to um, fix the, these dyes. So this is pretty awesome, but another thing that we learned when you start to design with living systems is that by working with a self-replicating system to design textiles, we're actually innovating uh, because of the novel processes we have to develop to be able to work uh, with these systems. So it's a huge area for how industry is going to work in the future. So for the Triennale next year at the Cooper Hewitt, we'll be um, exploring uh, engineered print processes that we have been developing over the years. Um, so please stay tuned to see um, how those new uh, projects develop. Other biological futures, uh, now this is a collaborative uh, effort between Faber Futures and Studio Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg. Um, in this joint editorial for MIT Press and MIT Media Lab, uh, we've been asking if designing with biology is going to make um, a better world and for whom and for what species um, this matters. Through a host of different conversations, uh, Daisy and I identified that we are at risk at collectivizing what is a single vision of biological futures based on the narratives of a few group of practitioners in the world. So how do we open this up? Our approach to this editorial was to make the technical pursuit, if you like, of biodesign completely contingent on the social realm. Um, and we discovered very quickly that once you bring the social into biodesign, the pool of who is a biodesigner expands and the kinds of voices that can contribute to the envis envisaging of um, our futures uh, also expands. So through other biological futures, Daisy and I are opening up a conversation about um, biodesign between practitioners whose practice is other to each other so that through these discussions, um, our authors, uh, of which Suzanne Lee and Christina Agapakis are um, uh, a pair, will be able to help us locate new possibilities of the design of biology. I highlight just one conversation between Jim Agiochi and a uh, synthetic biologist from, and co-founder of Colorifics, and Emika Okofa, who is founder of Maker Fair Africa and curator of TED Global. Now together they discuss how new tech startups in this space need to start thinking about not just the design of living organisms, but the uh, business models for a biotechnology that is open. Um, and uh, biotechnology that is open is important for equity across all its user base. So drawing from their own backgrounds in um, technology and from colorifics, colorifics is scaling the engineering of yeasts to produce pigments for textiles. Um, they show how distributed fermentation models could offer a business model that enables people to have autonomy as to how they work with uh, biofabrication in the future. So how do we imagine life after oil? Um, in this question, uh, we explored, we were invited by um, Tan Wien, uh, as the, we were invited by the ITHRA uh, as part of the Tan Wien, which is the Creativity Festival in Saudi Arabia. Um, and we really explored um, how the ecological, cultural, material, and frontier space in this environment um, is coming to is is playing itself out for a nation coming to terms terms with um, limits of an economy underpinned by fossil fuels. So we explored um, Saudi life after oil using this framework and quickly discovered that biodiversity is one of the key design spaces of the future. 
And finally, I'll end with uh, the Forbes Pigment Collection at um, Harvard. We've worked on a project uh, recently where we were invited to donate a pigment sample of Streptomyces sedicala to the archive. And our um, label for this pigment sample is actually DNA encoded um, into the sample. We've taken the uh, description of the project and encoded it into DNA, which is really a, a space that we're watching closely in, um, in terms of uh, biodesign. Or, and we really invite you um, to explore the idea that future archives are going to be encoded uh, using DNA. So I end with the last part of Yuval Noah Harari's um, initial statement, and it asks that in a post-digital era where we enter a deeper phase of connectivity, this time it is a connectivity to whole systems, living and non-living. This makes making with life complicated. What can be designed at the molecular scale should also be understood within a broader context so that what we design and what we decide to design embraces these technologies uh, within a broader context. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Is that you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I think so. I never know if Italians do the V of the last name or the, or the M. So, who's next? Is it Kurt van Mensford or is Maurizio Montalti? It's not Susanna Lee. Let's put Kurt. <laughs> yeah. Let's put Kurt. Susanna then. again. Yeah. No. no, not Suzanne. No. Mm -hmm. No. No. Let's go with Kurt van Mensford, please. Yay? No. I see some technicians, they are frantically uh, finding the file in the back of the hall. Yeah. Well, they'll get there. So in the meantime, maybe... Oh, they found you? No, no they not didn't. yet. They did you. So maybe in the meantime, I can tell you to start thinking of a question that I will ask you later, so maybe it'll take a little thinking, which is, what was your most improbable collaboration, like the weirdest collaboration you've had? We'll talk about it later. But in the meantime, have we found, Kurt? have we found Kurt's presentation? Not yet. Have we found Ma Maurizio's presentation? None? Okay. All right. Well, let's start, let's start answering this question then. Yeah, Kurt, please sit down comfortably. Oh, wait, oh, wait. So um, let's see, let's start with Suzanne. So what was the most improbable collaboration you found yourself in? Like the weirdest person you had to, or, or, or being, <laughs> that you had to work with? Well, there's, I think there's two answers there then. Yeah. The, the first one, you know, I think back in 2003, for me coming from fashion, and then um, setting up a collaboration with a biologist, we were two alien beings ourselves. You know, at that time, I didn't know anyone. 2003. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that for me was definitely a, a clash, um, but also a joyous moment of discovery for, for both of us. Um, but if I think about the most alien being, it's probably the kombucha organism that I ended up the kombucha, yeah. Or, you know, spending every day of my life with for 10 years. But it's funny because um, many designers said the same. We were talking about Oron Katz, who was such a pioneer in Perth, in uh, Australia. And the funny thing is that uh, if you go to Oron and Yonat's office, they're artists and designers. It's a, it's, it's a lab. And actually, they set it up in the art school, and now scientists, at the beginning it was kind of weird, but now scientists from the whole university want to go to it and use it because it is such a conducive environment, not only to scientific experimentation, but also to imagination. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I would like to ask Kurt, what was your most improbable collaboration? Well, I think in 2011, I started working with uh, a Professor Mark Post, who was then a tissue engineer growing heart valves. And uh, he was interested in the space of uh, growing meat. Uh, and he said, I'm going to present in two years' time the first lab-grown burger. And he was at the same university. So Which year was it? Again? This was in 2011, and he 2011. told me he was going to present this burger in 2012. Did that you he eat did it? not manage. He didn't make it, huh? No, but he made it in 2013, and it was a very expensive uh, burger, <laughs> yeah. 250,000 euro to make, because it was yeah, the first 
burger grown in the lab. So without having to slaughter an animal, we just take some cells and then we grow the burger. Um, I had meat chips. I don't know if I can say anything. Yes. But I tasted those a few years ago. You like them? Well, at the beginning, yes, they sounded like a beef jerky, and at the end, they had a little bit aftertaste that was metallic. But otherwise, they were, yeah, I could. Live yeah, on the them. metallic taste is actually it's a challenge because uh, that uh, relates to the the iron in in the blood. The iron, ah. And yeah, to grow that outside an animal, while not hurting an animal to have this meaty taste with iron and blood in it, it's a, it's a challenge, so well done. But see, 10 years of, uh, of exper or more of trying to make in vitro meat, interesting. And Maurizio, how, what about you? Weirdest collaboration, most improbable. Well, I feel very much in line actually with uh, what you stated earlier. Somehow, if I would have to reply very directly, it would be the collaboration with the living systems I'm working with. So it's my very fungi, my very strains. That's the creatures I nurture, and that's the uh, main um, collaborators I employ in my everyday practice. Mm -hmm. However, if I have to move out of that domain of microbial life, I can think about, no matter the collaboration with scientists that I wouldn't have anticipated happening in my life if I think about the years of my training. And so, it's actually the great know-how that I gained by um, encountering and exchanging with farmers. As in fact, the very practice that is uh, uh, driving uh, all the processes I'm concerned with is very much rooted in farming. It's about growing, it's about cultivating, it's possibly about doing it on a different scale than the macro scale usually characterizing food production, and it's about targeting growth in a different way than for growing food. In this case, it's of course for growing materials and goods. However, the approach towards scale that farmers have been capable of informing me with has been extremely valuable and very unexpected. Mm, so interesting, and that's a It'll, it'll go, come Will up. it go? Yes. On? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, I, I share with everybody this new symbiosis with living systems. Um, they kind of dictate everything that you do, what time you have to wake up to go and nurture them. Um, and when I'm producing um, textiles, my entire timetable has to shift to accommodate their life cycle. Um, so it's a real mental switch as a designer to think about, um, you know, how you live within the constraints of biology to make with biology. Um, and then I think um, one of the more improbable um, human uh, collaborations is perhaps with Ginkgo Bioworks. Um, I sort of infiltrated them last year. That's, a, that's a, a biofabrication company also. Uh -huh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to spend some time there to work on my textiles and convince them to keep me for five months. Um, and I uh, used that time to really understand how we might be able to have a residency program for creatives within mm -hmm. that environment and learning from my interactions with people as I did my work, how that could be a model for um, future uh, creatives. And now the Ginkgo Creative Res Residency is something that we launched this year. Um, and we hope to nurture this exchange between scientists, engineers, and designers into the future. Mm -hmm. Have we made any progress with the presentations? Doesn't seem that way. Thumbs so, up. Yeah. Think, what is that? That's a thumbs, thumbs up. up. Thumbs oh, up. then it's, you can yeah, go. Yeah, we don't see it here good, yet, good. but it's... Kurt. Oh, Yay. exactly. There you go. So now oh, I only need fab. a clicker. Yeah, indeed. Um, Kurt van Mensvoort. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Biofabrication. <laughs> Yay. Biofabrication is about uh, the merging between biology and technology. And before I get into my uh, speculative work, I like to zoom out a little bit uh, and take a look at our planet at night. Because a thousand years ago, if you would look at our planet at night, things would be pitch black. But today, when you look at Earth, you see all these lights emerging. So what's happening? Is it springtime on planet Earth or is it on fire? If you zoom in, you learn a lot, like where are the blue states and the red states, you see the rise of India, uh, you see Europe as this starry blanket with one lonely star in the east. Uh, there are also still vast empty areas on our planet, like Greenland or the Amazon rainforest, which is less empty than I expected. 
Let's look in the Sahara. There we see natural structures like the river now emerging because of all the cultural activity around it, all the technology basically happening there. And we also see political and economical decisions. This is the North Korean border. It is a very different situation in uh, Pyongyang than in Seoul. And we are here today trying to make sense of what's going on. I want to zoom out even more um, to understand this changing relation between biology and technology. And then we need to start at the beginning. Um, it is now some 4.5 billion years ago since our planet came into existence. And at first it was just this lonely rock floating in space. It had a geosphere, but it took 3 billion years before a biosphere evolved upon planet Earth. 3 billion years. And then one billion year later, people emerged. So we've just arrived. However, I can tell you our presence does not go unnoticed. Because with our ingenuity and technology, we cause the rising of this new sphere on planet Earth, the technosphere. And just like this biosphere evolves upon and interacts with the geosphere underneath, now this technosphere emerges upon the biosphere. It is a very simple message, right? Um, evolution goes on. But I think the most important story of our time is that we are go living in a time in which the born and the made are fusing or blending. And as a result, also our notions of nature and culture have become a bit like complicated. Because traditionally we, we think of nature as everything that is born. Plants, animals, the climate, the universe. That's the natural world and culture, that's what we make. But now this is... Mixing, actually I think it's shifting. And I want to get into this with a very simple graph that I'm sure we can all understand. If we put on one axis born versus made, and then on another axis we put um, controlled versus autonomous or uncontrolled, then I've now created four quadrants and I can put all kinds of things in there to understand the world around us. So first in this born made quadrant you will find a rainbow rose, a bonsai tree, genetically modified banana or chicken. These are natural born entities that we now control up to the level that we say this is not nature anymore, it's design. At the same time there are still a lot of born nature left that we do not control. Think of viruses, uh, volcanoes, lightning or the sun. The sun is so much bigger than us, we don't have any control. No, we are not the masters of the universe, we're not gods, we can be a bit modest still. Then on the made side, you find things like a car, a telephone, a light bulb, or a robo dog. Not too exciting. But if you go in that upper quadrant, things become more interesting. There we find um, traffic jams, digital networks, artificial intelligence, cities, computer viruses, and the financial system. Yes, we made it, but are we still controlling it? Or does it have this natural dynamic of its own? I think biofabricating is really in the middle of this axis, in the center. And is it natural? Well, perhaps our notion of nature is also shifting. Is technology becoming our next nature? And then, what's ahead of us? What is our future? Um, will this be the ultimate luxury in due time? I don't know if this is the uh, ultimate fashion statement or female agony, I think the latter. Uh, don't worry, it is a Photoshop image. Maybe we do organs first, um, a branded butterfly. Just do it, or let's start with some microorganisms. Here you see an algae lamp. Algae, they live on sunlight, photosynthesis. And then we take a little bit of energy from the algae to light the lamp. If you turn the lamp on too often, well, it's bad for the algae, you have to replace them. So it's this very clear connection between biology and technology which is also the case in the final project I like to show. Um, these are the genetically modified Stingray leather sneakers, yes. And here we did a speculative company. Um, I show you the commercial. The idea is that there's this company, rayfish.com, and they hacked the DNA of Stingray fishes. On their website, rayfish.com, you can go there and experience everything. You can design your own fish according to your likings with a pattern that you love. And then after three months time in this fish farm, your fish is turned into your own bio-customized Stingray leather sneaker.
Well, well, about 10,000 people wanted this sneaker and participated in a contest. There were also, I think, 10,000 people who said, well, this is taking our consumptive attitude towards animals maybe one step too far. Um, this sneaker is made of genuine stingray leather. It's still painted, I have to add. So it's a speculation, it's still a fiction. Um, but I am sure about uh, one thing, is that we have to understand that we created this technosphere. It was never our plan or design. It kind of grew around us, but it's not going away. We cannot go back to nature. We have to combine biology and technology to go forward to nature. Because in the end, this is not happening on one sphere, but it's all happening on, it's not happening on three spheres. It's happening on one sphere, which happens to be our planet. Thank you. And Maurizio, your turn. <laughs> so, good morning everybody. It's a great honor to be here. Thanks again, Paula. Thanks to Alta Gamma for offering this great opportunity. And I think it's an opportunity also to a little bit expand on some of the notions that have been uh, introduced earlier. I see that maybe the presentation has not been working too effectively, but uh, possibly that I always have case. questions in case. Right. Oh, here it is. And now, yeah, we can skip this. Now, I'm a, I'm a designer by background. I still define myself as such, no matter if the practice that I carry on with is rather multifaceted. And uh, actually, my very practice has been strongly influenced by starting to decide to collaborate with living systems and organisms, and specifically fungi, something that was born out of a design frustration. As a designer maker, I was very much confronted with uh, dealing with uh, different kind of synthetic matters and we all know about the implications that synthetic materials and specifically different kind of plastic materials has have been having on our ecosystem so just to expand a little bit on the fungal mycelium that has been mentioned several times today already in the morning what you look at here is in fact the actual fungus so we all know the mushrooms right so we we know them they are we put them on our table they are the fruiting bodies that are just the reproductive stage the reproductive body of a much wider organism which is called mycelium it's the actual fungus which consists of a, a very intricate network of interlocking cells, it's these long filamental cells that are to be seen on a microscopic level, not seen, not possible to see with the naked eye. Uh, so, as Paolo also mentioned earlier when mentioning the PS1 uh, uh, project at MoMA, uh, when actually fungal mycelia are fed with different kind of uh, um, waste streams or byproducts deriving from other value chains, such as, for instance, the agro-industry, they consume such materials and at the same time while degrading them and transforming them in some sort of chitinous matter, chitin being one of the most important polymers in the natural world, they actually assemble the materials in a cohesive kind of matter. And that was the very uh, ground that gave me the opportunity to start reflecting on introducing new ways of looking at design and at production, not anymore filtered through the idea of exploiting finite resources, but actually of employing living systems for methods rooted in growth and cultivation, inspired by agriculture, but transported, of course, uh, in our current biotech era. The advantage of this is the fact that actually we can create materials, and here you see some of the uh, early um, uh, productions that derived from the studio work. We can actually uh, create materials that uh, speak honestly, as it was also touched upon during the uh, WGSN's speech. These materials actually have textures and have expressed a language that clearly speaks about the process that brought them to life originally. And they are responsible products. They are 100% natural in their essential form. At the same time, it is possible to imagine, and here I see also an, an image is missing, uh, to completely revolutionize manufacturing processes, as in fact it is possible to imagine actually merging different parts in a product just by means of fungal adhesion, so growth processes, without the need of screwing, gluing, and adding too many extra materials within one very product. Uh, somehow I believe that designers, and that was my case, have a great responsibility in making this kind of developments becoming a reality. Very often you see wonderful experimental design projects that just stay at that very level. 
And uh, personally, I decided to embark in a, in a live challenge when deciding actually to try and transport the experience generated as part of my Amsterdam-based crea Amsterdam creative practice to scale and so to reach industry in order to possibly reach with this type of innovation the largest collectivity. Uh, that's where we started uh, uh, to incorporate about three and a half years ago a company based here in Italy actually in the north of Milan in the province of Varese called Mogu where we are standardizing and scaling up a number of technologies concerning the use of mycelium for the creation of different typologies of products with a specific uh, focus on interior but particularly with a specific focus on product. It's a design driven company uh, animated by biotech processes, but I like to emphasize this part of the product-driven approach because what we have understood along these years is that it's absolutely not sufficient to be able to learn how to grow a material to state that a product is there ready for the market. We have been learning that uh, uh, through many sensational announcements being made by the many actors in the field, uh, we created false expectation in the audience. And that's what drives us these days, actually, to develop products which incorporate yet the natural technology I'm talking about, but not only. We also develop a lot of other technologies that uh, uh, can be applied to the material in order to let it become a final product. As, for instance, surface treatments, coatings of different kinds of a natural origin that still can make the product at the end, very performative. These days have been a focus on, uh, for instance, as I mentioned, solutions for interior like acoustic uh, absorption panels, which can be engineered starting from the biology and starting from uh, the definition of what's the openings uh, at a micro level in order to actually make the most efficient uh, sound absorption. Um, here what you see, and you probably saw a slide talking about fashion and leather, it's the similar process to what uh, you saw in the video before, but actually when we cultivate fungi on different kind of nutritious substrates, so not solid matters, but uh, liquid matters through processes of fermentations, we can actually create an another family of different materials. Materials that in fact can be, as mentioned also earlier, uh, similar to a certain extent to leather, but beware, it's not leather. It's actually um, materials that can be seen as fabrics and ca that can have experiential qualities similar to the ones of traditional animal leather with a great advantage of the fact that they grow in a very, very limited time frame, um, about 10, mm, to two weeks, 10 days to 14 days, as opposed to the three or more years that it takes cattle to be grown for eventually harvesting the skin to then be processed into leather. And of course, we are here tackling also all the environmental issues and impact that derives from all the processes of treatment of traditional animal hides. So, in some ways, what we are trying to do is to uh, actually um, show that it is possible to achieve certain utopian dreams, and they are not so utopians. On a side, we actually speculate on visionary perspectives as through this project that was uh, a commission uh, to um, Liz Chocalio, a London-based designer, and myself by Paola, uh, thanks to actually the um, items uh, uh, exhibition at MoMA last year, where we were speculating about growing a Mars boot along space travel uh, in order to actually provide the astronauts uh, with the material and with utilities by making use of their very residual uh, fluids from their body. But at the same time, we are making this work these days in practice on Earth. And here we have uh, some other image missing, but you can see some processual images, and I deliberately didn't polish them. I want to show you actually how the materials grow, how they are in their very origin. And of course, they can be transformed, they can be engineered, textures can emerge, and the materials can be high, hyper-functionalized, starting once again from the biology. Oh, as I have to come to a conclusion, I skip very quickly, and I tell you that, in fact, this is not just about replacing traditional materials. Clearly, it is possible to work with those materials and process them in traditional ways. However, it's about envisioning new possibilities, tackling completely the way we conceive production. So it's not anymore about assembling, it's about growing products in one go. And that's something that we try, of course, to also experiment with through different prototyping activities. I want to leave you with just one question and close this presentation by asking, is it actually uh, 
possible to co-design with living systems to enhance natural ecosystems or maybe even industrial ecosystems? Well, I believe it is very possible and that's what I personally am very committed to. And I hope that this panel and these introductions and these presentations possibly are going to also positively uh, encourage you to dive deeper into this subject and to make it your own in order to co-develop and co-work towards a future better development. Thank you. Yay, well done. <laughs> Wonderful. So um, I'm going to launch because um, I think with the audience that we have, which is an audience of uh, design professionals, manufacturers, entrepreneurs, it's about the beautiful ideas that you've been able to carry into the real world through hard work. You know, you've you founded enterprises, companies. Now, when you hit the real world, the real world is also a world of regulations and laws and standards. So I would like to know about those challenges, especially from Suzanne, I suppose, and Maurizio. Not that you're getting there, and probably Kurt, you also know about it from the outside, but I want to ask you about something else. So Suzanne and Maurizio, what about the standards and regulations? How do you go about it? How many people are working on that at Modern Meadow? Yeah, safety, testing. I mean, I no, no, she has. Um, to some extent, everybody. everybody. It's the responsibility of the whole company. Mm -hmm. um, in a way, we're many companies in one. So we have a cell engineering team, bioprocessing, material science, design, and so on. But everybody goes through lab training, all our partnerships with brands, also start from a original specification, an understanding of things like RSLs, so restricted substance lists. Um, we educate the people that we work with around really the, the fullness of the technology, the opportunities around the technology, and the limits and the challenges that come with that as well. But when it comes to governmental regulations, maybe I can ask Maurizio because mm. the EU is a complicated place, you know. So when it comes to regulations and standards, did you have to prove, convince, cajole? Yeah, course, all of, of the above. <laughs> of course, it's a, it's a daily challenge. Now, when thinking about the standards in general, inevitably, when we grow the materials, we need to uh, comply to existing standards. Why, actually, it's a bit controversial because we are trying to redefine the standard. However, in order to come there, we also have to inevitably interact with a very wide array of actors, which are eventually our clients, which uh, in this kind of in-between development stage are mostly looking for replacement materials very often. And they want these replacement materials to behave exactly as traditional materials. And therefore, if I think about, again, technical qualities of the materials, inevitably you need to rely and comply to traditional ISO or ASTM standards, depending on the specific market and the specific material and or product that you're referring to. But besides that, of course, when it comes to regulation in terms of certification, that is a major bottleneck very often. E the EU, as we know, has very severe regulations. And to be honest, that is a good thing. Uh, and possibly it's never enough to have very strict regulations. However, uh, certainly policymakers have so far not made it easy for products which are rather innovative and rather unknown by the largest collectivity for such products to enter in a market. What we are trying to do is to create a new market, which no matter how much we are talking about this, it on stage, for instance, right now, doesn't yet exist. And there maybe you can start with the people. I, I ban from my vocabulary the word, word consumer, because I think that's how you change things by not uttering it anymore. So um, are people the ones that help you create the new market, probably? Right? Most definitely, yes. Uh, I think it has been very interesting for us through different research projects that we have been conducting, the fact of working directly with, uh, let's call them users and the people that actually will benefit uh, uh, the introduction of such technology, which is indeed, by the way, the ultimate aim besides all kind of entrepreneurial goals. The ultimate aim of all of this is the fact of really creating a benefit for the larger society. That is at least what motivates. Yeah. And it's also creating a new culture, and that's what I wanted to ask Nate. You work with bacteria. The problem from a cultural viewpoint are the ones that get people's hair behind their necks stand up the most. So what did you have to do to make them be comfortable uh, with bacteria? 
Has it been a challenge? Maybe not at all. But. No, no, it's going to start going. It's just I, I think that uh, one of the challenges is um, how far removed we are from um, bacteria in our daily lives. It's not visible. Uh, perhaps the effects might be. Um, and in my experience, what tends to break the ice, if you like, is inviting somebody to culture a microbe from their own body so that they can start to visualize this incredible ecosystem that lives on them, that is them. Like doing the cheese that... Uh Christina Absolutely. and Sister had done, um, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and my own lab induction was, um, here is a Petri dish, put your hand on it so that you can understand this relationship we have. Uh, and so in a post-germ theory environment, I think that um, people are going to become more accustomed to understanding how uh, the living is very much um, at multiple scales, and bacteria is just one way of, of seeing that. Talking about customs, mm -hmm. what happens when you go through plane, through airports? <laughs> you know, I, I can imagine you all have interesting stories of going through airports with with bacteria that is going to be just like bio dyes for your tissues, but still for your fabrics, but still are bacteria. <laughs> I have one extraordinary experience um, that taught me a very good lesson. Actually, I think I was on my way to biofabricate the first one. Um, and I had a, a Petri dish in my, um, in my bag, and I was stopped at customs for two hours. And I had to prove that I was coming to America <laughs> for biofabricate, so I had to put my display, um, my design display. Uh, I remember that display, yeah. And I had to justify what that Petri dish was doing by giving the presentation. That's and that nice. convinced them that I was not a bioterrorist. Well, at and least so they listened to never, you. Yeah. <laughs> never again. <laughs> yeah. Which leads me to Kurt, the philosopher. What about the ethics of it all? I mean, in some cases, the circularity, the sustainability are just clear and transparent. In other cases, not. So what's going on when it comes to both legislation and ethics panel and also to the dissemination of this new culture? Yes, I think it's extremely important to have that uh, ethical discussion about how should we act because we, we have technical hurdles. We have legal hurdles, but maybe the social cultural hurdles, they're also huge. And um, often um, people have a certain view on something because they have existing knowledge in their mind. So what you are describing feels a lot to me also like the, the, the horseless carriage. Uh, this notion that we have the car is invented, but we don't know the concept and we we can understand it as a horseless carriage, but we haven't anticipated that this new technology brings us new products, new lifestyles, a whole new culture. And this is shifting all the time. And what I think is that uh, it's important to, uh, to have this debate, to make it very tangible so that it's, well, inclusive and that people can participate, and then project on all these different futures, both dreams and nightmares, and have an open conversation about what future we actually want. To add to that, I think, uh, I anticipate that there will be a shifting view on how we see um, microbes, bacteria, and single GM cellular food, organisms. Also genetically modified foods, perhaps? Maybe as well, because that's also, that has been uh, by the uh, traditional nature movement put in a certain corner, uh, whereas if you look at the whole history of of agriculture and cooking, basically agriculture 10,000 years ago, it was the biotechnology of that time. Um, and now it defines our food and we think it's normal, it's natural, but it is shifting. So we should uh, uh, not see nature as something static, but as something dynamic that changes along with us. And then time after time, we're playing with fire, yes, and we have to be very precise and concise in doing that. Um, but then I'm hopeful, because it, in a way it's also a wonder how far we are now that we've gotten this far. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have one last question to the designers, so not the philosopher right now, but the designers here on the, on the stage. Uh, your type of creativity does not really match the stereotype of creativity that is held in many countries in the world, certainly also in Italy, although Italy has always appreciated engineering as almost like an aesthetic discipline unto itself. But um, how do you explain the fact that you are creatives, that you are designers, um, as if you were talking to an audience of like 
eight-year-olds and telling them during the, cl the class day in which you explain that there are different professions, how do you tell them that you're both designers, artists, designers I prefer, and also um, lovers of science and open to that? I mean, I, I, I think the eight-year-olds are the most receptive. Yeah, I know, it's true. Right? <laughs> because they've not yet been exposed yeah. to the silos that academia yeah. you okay, know, puts let's, people let's in. Let's say 58. 58-year-old. <laughs> How do you explain to that? <laughs> I love the eight-year-olds. I know, me too. <laughs> They're the best, it's true. Mm -mm. I mean, I think... I don't know how others feel. I, 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 I think usually for me it's more thinking about how can I explain my creative practice, which is rather unorthodox, to my grandma, which is 97 years old and still very clever. Uh, and that's very hard because, of course, you need to bring it down to essence and still uh, show how um, intricate is everything that is there behind. I actually like to explain usually about how it's about just making use of the tools and the know-how belonging to another field of application that though are filtered through a methodology which is fully design driven, so it is the approach that matters. And in the practice, this on a theori theoretical level as well, but in the practice, it is that ingenuity in working with materials that allows you to unexpectedly encounter something that you would have never anticipated, the very concept of serendipity, which is, as a designer, what really drives, in my very case at least, your work, and what made such a, a very unexpected development happen, something that I could have never anticipated on. Nasse? Mm -hmm. um, my, my grandmother weirdly gets Grandmothers it. are where it's at. Yeah. She gets it, she does. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's because of a mindset, right? Um, and so I always try to explain, um, and it is a journey to, to, to arrive at the point where you know how to frame it, um, that it is looking at technologies as we did with the digital era and understanding how they fit within a creative context. Um, so for me, it's just an evolution from that period, from the digital era to the biological era, mm -hmm. and that's how creativity can live in that space. Now, um, I said it was last, now it's really last, <laughs> but if we look at Modern Meadow or Mogu, are your materials available so can people buy them, or do they have to enter in partnerships with you and grow them with you? Oh. Both answers are right in the yeah. sense that the materials will soon, and it's not going to be materials, it's going to be products, are soon going to be available. And uh, I'm not here making a, a launch, but. Uh, no, I'm, the, I, listen, uh, we're all like entrepreneurs here, <laughs> and Italians love the fact that design can be had, yeah, right? We're so actually going to release our first collections at the beginning of 2019, this concerning the interior products, going from flooring, uh, resilient flooring, to acoustic absorption models and so forth. Mm -hmm. However, it is true that uh, it is very important, uh, uh, as I try to address during my presentation, to engage with uh, uh, very important partners which have the capability of letting you learn and understand better how certain value chains work and how certain industrial production processes of a traditional nature work and to engage with each other in a full co-development process as opposed to the behavior of most of the corporations that reach out as clients these days having uh, as a query the one of just uh, having volumes ready tomorrow served on a silver plate. Well, that's never going to happen. Suzanne? Yeah, I, I agree with Maurizio. It's a very different model. So we're, I think we're going to bring the best quality materials to market that really serve people's needs by working with brands directly, understanding what for them makes this new material interesting, and not trying to replicate what's gone before, not trying to mimic the way the natural world does it, but really understanding the new de design possibilities that come with these materials. So we have chosen to partner with certain brands um, for long-term real development relationships. And you know, as I mentioned in my talk, these materials are not coming to market overnight. Um, they're the product of years of development, right? And so there's, um, if you're going to partner with a brand, there needs to be a mutual understanding around timeline and really what it takes to do that co-development. Mm -hmm. Many more questions remain, I'm sure. And this is only the beginning, but it's quite clear that what was explained several times on the stage, that it's a new material revolution, 
is true. And also, it's a revolution in culture, also in entrepreneurial culture. It's a different way to also be partners uh, amongst you know, entrepreneurs and material manufacturers and producers. So um, I really hope that the extraordinary panel that you just listened to and Suzanne's keynote inspired you to dig further. There's a lot about biodesign and biofactoring available to all. But in the meantime, I want to thank you very, very much for this great presentation and conversation. And I'm going to give the word to my colleagues, to actually uh, Tony, that will come here for our next point in the program. So thank you thank very you much. Thank you, Paola.